Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Um, welcome to TDU's live uh, lighting masterclass. If you guys could just hop over in the chat window and say, yes, you can hear me and see me, that would be great. Uh, I just want to verify that everything's working well. Hi. All right. Perfect. That, that works for me, Michelle. Thank you so much. All right. So let's get rolling today. What are we going to be talking about today? Today is all about you guys. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking you through uh, the whys of lighting, which is a big part of TDU. It's a big part of what we do here. Uh, we're going to be talking you through a actual lighting setup where I'm going to show you all how I lit this character, this Mr. Bean character. Then we're going to talk about some TDU courses. Uh, and then we're going to have a very special, super secretive offer for you all. But the first thing that I want each and every one of you to do is focus because we honestly feel like we've put together something here that can change your life. We, and by we, I mean Jasmine Katata, Karn and I. Jasmine's on this as well. Jasmine, can you say hi? She'll be moderating the questions over here to the right-hand side. Um, what we've done is we've put together a school and a presentation where we feel like we can change your guys' lives. And that's not just us talking. We've demonstrated that in the past. We've gotten plenty of people jobs in this industry. We've changed lives. We've done career-changing things. But we'll get to that at the end. But I, what I need you to do, close your phones, close all the tabs in your windows, and really zero in because this is the opportunity you owe to yourself to really uh, get after it and change your career. Okay, enough of that. Let's get going. So for starters, my name is Mike Tanzillo. I am a senior lighter at Blue Sky Studios. I'm also a uh, co-founder here at TDU. Um, it's been a long path for me to get into a lighting career. I was an art major, a photography major at the Ohio State University. Um, after I graduated, I was very unqualified for many jobs. So I was doing some wedding photography. I was bartending. Um, I was just kind of making ends meet. And I really didn't know what I wanted for my future. And then I watched Finding Nemo. Um, I actually watched the behind the scenes to Finding Nemo. And that was the thing that changed my life. Because that showed me a group of scuba divers uh, scuba diving off the coast of Australia. And their job was to create the lighting for Finding Nemo. And what they were doing is they were judging the way that the ocean looked in the wide open ocean versus very close to Sydney. And it just absolutely blew me away. It was the most beautiful, fascinating thing. I had no idea that this job existed. And I knew the second I watched that, that this is what I want to do. So I started teaching myself uh, Cinema 4D, and I kind of got into it, started applying for jobs. Again, still grossly underqualified for these positions. Uh, so I did the only thing that I could think to do then. I went back to grad school, took out a huge loan, uh, went to the Savannah College of Art and Design, was there for a couple of years, had a um, uh, great experience. I got out, started applying for jobs, still getting turned down, had no idea why. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get a render wrangling job, and over the course of the last Oh, I don't know, over a decade now, I've managed to make my way up as to a senior lighter at Blue Sky, worked on over 10 films, um, and I have learned so, so much in the industry, and I learned exactly what I was doing wrong um, when I was in school and when I was trying to teach myself, because I was so focused on learning the software and learning how to light that I never really questioned the whys of lighting. I never questioned, like, uh, what the motivation was, like how to tell a story. I didn't know any of that. I was, I, I so, so, so thought that companies would care about whether or not I knew this software or that software. I just assumed that that's what they wanted to know. But in reality, they wanted to see that I could like to tell a story. And that's what we're here to teach you. Jasmine and I are here to teach you guys the whys of lighting. So let's get into that. So what are the whys of lighting? So again, most lighting courses will talk about how to create lights, how to change their color, how to change their intensity. Um, but we're here to talk about the whys of lighting. We want to talk about why you place a light in a certain spot. What is your motivation? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? There's three things. And this is the three things that we'll talk about over and over and over again. We've mentioned, we'll mention them in every single one of our classes. We will constantly talk about them in every single uh, shot that you uh, submit to us. And that's these three things. One, emphasizing the mood. Two, directing the viewer's eye. And three, sculpting visual shaping. So let's go through them one at a time. So we've got emphasizing mood. At the core of what we're doing, what any artist is doing on animated film is we are helping tell a story. And for lighters, that means we're using light, color, shadow quality, darkness, all that good stuff to help tell the director's story or help tell the writer's story. So we'll have scenes like this. And as an artist, you'll get a note, you know, say you're working on this shot from Tangled and you'll get the note 
we needed to feel romantic. We needed to feel soft. We needed to feel happy. So as the artist, you know, okay, well, lots of warm tones, lots of soft shadows, lots of happiness, like glowy elements. Like, look how glowy this is and soft and to focus everything is. It's beautiful. And that's there to help tell the story. The opposite of that, we've got the corpse, right? We've got lots of dark shadows, lots of heavy tones, lots of dark tones, sharp shadows. Um, just kind of a, uh, uh, we've taken all the warmth out of this shot, just very dark, contrasty stuff. And this isn't something new. This is uh, Nosferatu. This is one of the first horror movies from uh, 1922. And you can see, even in the silent film era, they're using lots of contrast, lots of darkness, lots of just, frankly, creepy lighting in order to get this guy to to look a certain way and have the audience feel a certain way. Now, these two images, like immediately you can see them, you think that they're very, very different, but at their core, they're pretty much the same thing. It's just a single female character standing in the middle of the frame, uh, just not quite full body. Um, but you can see on the left, it's clearly happier. The colors are much more saturated. There's no shadow in her eyes or no hard shadows anywhere on her face. And I mean, granted her expression is very happy, which certainly helps, but we're, the lighting is emphasizing that mood. And if you look at the screen uh, right side, um, we've got, uh, you know, we, we, we almost don't even see her eyes. There's so much darkness, so much shadow there, so much dark, heavy uh, lines and, 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 and just sharp shadows everywhere. Just a completely different mood with very, very similar subject matter. I could even work with the exact same character. We've got Mr. Incredible here. In this shot, this is early in the movie. He's the insurance salesman. He hates his job. He hates his life. He's um, bummed out. He's got to tell this uh, woman that he can't fill her insurance claim. His life is bad. And look at him. He looks sick. His, there's no warmth in his skin. It's completely drained. It's, uh, he, he looks almost lifeless here versus towards the end of the movie when he's back to be his superhero ways. Like he is just pumping full of blood and, and that's the lighting and that's pushing that color so we can really feel his emotions and his energy. Take this shot from the movie Epic. Um, so in this scene, it's very similar to Tangled. Uh, these two characters are falling in love here. They're walking through the forest, they're little teeny tiny characters and they run into this deer and it's glowy and it's beautiful and it's magical and it's soft. And, and uh, again, it's all based on the color, the light, the shadow. Now, if we just take out the color, it changes the shot a little bit, right? Like it takes it from being this warm, uh, romantic, uh, affectionate thing and makes it more like a documentary, like they're studying this creature now. And then if you shift it the other way and make it like a blue green, now they're just like on an alien planet with this crazy large creature. And like, you feel like they might be in danger. <laughs> like this thing's about to eat them. And all we've done is shifted the colors. An interesting one that I really like is the association with color and food. And now, most food in nature is warmer in tones. And so uh, by default, we tend to like that. We tend to flock to warmer toned foods um, versus blue food, which tends to not be that appetizing. Uh, this came up in a study when they said, hey, if you want to lose weight, uh, if you just eat off of a blue plate, you're less likely to overeat. And because blue puts together the psychological thing in our head, um, that will tell you not to eat so much. See, we're not only here to talk about lighting, we're going to give you guys uh, health tips as well. Um, so how does that work for a lighting artist? Well, say you've got a little kid and he's coming home to a big feast and he's been out in the rain all day and his day has been terrible. But look, there's this huge feast on the table. As a lighting artist, that you know that means you want to hit it with a lot of warm light, like really lift it up and make it nice and, and bold and beautiful and, and, and awesome. But then he looks over and he's got to eat the Brussels sprouts or whatever he hates before he can have the rest of it. Boom, you hit that with some cool light, like pull out all that warm value and it's just unappetizing and like, ugh. And, and again, the words are helping tell the story, but of course we're visual artists and we visually are helping that story along. Uh, light and color can be also used to emphasize off-camera hope. So again, um, in this film, uh, Edmund uh, is a donkey. Uh, this is a very cool shot, very kind of sad and melancholy, but in the uh, halfway through the shot, the screen left side opens up, some warm light comes pouring in, and all of a sudden he's got some hope. He's got some opportunity about what's happening off here just by that light and color shift. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, this is from The Emperor's New Groove. So in this movie, there's uh, this potion, this pink potion that turns the main character into an animal. And uh, right before that potion is introduced by the, the villain, you'll see if you watch the film that for like 20 or 30 shots leading up to it, they will actually 
pull out warmth out of all the shots and they make the colors a little bit bluer, a little bit uh, cooler, a little bit desaturated. So all of a sudden this character turns around, grabs a potion, boom, puts it in front of the camera like this. And then the pink color just pops off. The audience is immediately attracted to that. And then for the rest of the film, they've limited that pink color to just that potion. So now like anytime, if like someone drinks it, they burp it, like that burp will be pink or whatever. It's totally isolated to that. And that's something that lighting can help enhance, that that pink color is associated with that character. Again, going back to Epic, we've got our warm tone hero, char hero characters versus the cool tone uh, villain. So the warm tone characters are all about life and energy and the warmth of the forest, uh, where the cool characters are all about death and destruction. And so as lighting, we always try to make sure that they read as those two different things. Next up, directing the viewer's eye. What does this mean? Okay, so directing the viewer's eye means that in films, you oftentimes have a very, very short window, a very small window to uh, tell the story of the shot because the shot may only be a second, two seconds, even less than a second. I think my record shortest shot it was six frames. I've, I've lit a six frame shot before, which is a quarter of a second long. So you've got that time period to focus the audience's eye on what's the most important thing in the story. Because oftentimes there'll be like seven characters and you need to get the direction uh, focused on one thing. Or it'll be like a big character holding something little, and you need to get the audience's eye focused right here on the thing that they're holding. Take this example from Tangled, right? So this is a character. She's uh, pointing to this painting, and the painting uh, has to do with what the story that she's telling. So they've created this slash of light coming through that draws a viewer's eye and, and pretty much flanks off. So anything, um, let's try this guy, anything, anything, sorry, anything that's like outside of that is dark and you're not focused on it. You're just focusing in on what she has there, what, what, what is going on inside that light source. Similarly, in this Monsters, Inc. shot, um, you can see there's that, that path of light that he's walking down. Because again, he was, uh, Mike Wazowski here in the foreground is the main character, but it's more important to know that he's walking down this path, to lead the viewer's eye down this path, to know where he's heading. We can direct the viewer's eye through some basic... Uh, uh, basically, you just want to create a contrast. You either want to create light elements over dark, uh, complementary colors, you want to, or warm colors over cool. You want the thing that you want to pop forward to be different than the thing behind it. Sorry, I got those mixed up. There we go. Doo -doo. And uh, so you just want those to be a little bit different. Here's some examples from some animated shorts. We've got a dark uh, character popping over a very warm uh, bright sunset. We've got bright characters in the middle over a dark background. And I really like this one on the right where we've got orange tone characters, like his vest is orange over the blue uh, sky in the background. And then he got his blue jeans over the very warm canyons there as well. A good trick, and I learned this from when I was studying photography, is that if you wanna read your image and analyze whether or not the values are popping forward, you just you can really just look at it and, and squint your eyes and, and, and make the image blurry. I can't force you guys to squint your eyes. So on the right-hand side here, I went ahead and blurred up the image so you can kind of see that. So you can get kind of like the rough, the, like just like the rough concept of the shapes and see if, if anything's standing out and popping forward there. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, this is 12 Angry Men. And in this film, not only are they doing a really great job of popping light characters over dark backgrounds, but they are hyper-focusing the viewer's eye to the eyes of the characters. And they're doing that by flanking uh, his head and pretty much all these guys. So th this movie is about 12 jurors and they go around and they're always giving their opinions. And, and you can see they always are like putting uh, barn doors on the lights or something to fla flap it off and, and cut off um, the shadows and have, well, this guy's wearing a hat, so that's just cheating. But you can see that they're hyper-focusing that. And I love that. And I love to try and uh, do that for my shots as well. We've got this shot from uh, Fantastic Flying Books of Mr. Morris Lesmore, another amazing animated short you should check out. And this is a little bit different. So he's over a very bright background and he is a darker element that's popping forward. So in this shot, it's structured where we've got dark elements on the outside, bright in the middle, and then he's right in the middle of that and he's able to, his uh, darkness is able to pop off forward there. And now we've got uh, Spider-Man, the Spider-Verse. I just watched this again last night for like the third time. 
Absolutely incredible movie. Congratulations to everyone who worked on Into the Spider-Verse on your Academy Award. That's huge. Uh, I'll t and we had a TDU student who worked on Into the Spider-Verse. I'll tell you guys about him later, but uh, just a huge, uh, beautiful movie. Go check it out if you haven't already. And in this shot, we've got warm tones, the blue character popping off over the cool background. And really, and also like the whiteness of his eyes, the hyper focus around the whiteness of the eyes is really popping it forward too, because that's the brightest part of the image. Again, we've got uh, some dark, a dark character reading over a bright background. This is like warmth over cool. Also a little bit of brightness in play here as well. This is one of my, this is a really cool shot. This is a promo image for the Secret Life of Kells. So you can see here, this is more using complexity versus simplicity. So around the character is all these very complex, very small shapes of all the leaves and the detail in there. And then once you get in the middle, you just see the big circles of the character's eyes and the very simple mouth. And it's just simple and clean and nice and smooth. And if that smoothness is what's actually popping the character out that way. So you can use complexity versus simplicity. And in that same vein, I love Bambi. I, I, I've already listed like seven movies that I think are my favorite in this. So I absolutely love movies and I can talk about this stuff all day. So in Bambi, we've got a, again, this is warm tone character over the background, but look at that background. I guarantee you, you've never thought of it this way, but those backgrounds are so abstract. They're just some simple shapes. They're just a, a suggestion of the environment, a suggestion of, of this forest back behind them. But like, there is no forest there. Like, look, like right in the middle, there's just a handful of, of colors. And so in this, they're using the simplicity of the background to kind of smooth things out and allowing the more detailed, uh, sharper shapes of the characters to pop forward. You can also use leading lines to emphasize this. This is one of Jasmine's photographs. So you can, uh, you've got all these lines like leading back to one point in space. And as lighters, you can emphasize that and really kind of create those suggestive lines. Depth of field is a big tool as well. So this is from Feast. And here are two shots. Ex well, it's the exact same shot, but it's allowing using depth of field or, uh, uh, the, the, that, photo that, uh, photography, um, a uh, trick of creating things in and out of focus to focus the eye on two different elements. So this guy's holding this uh, uh, herb in his hand and it's reminding him of his ex and he's focusing on it. And so we're kind of focusing on him and you can see the reflections of that in his eye, which are really cool. And it's focusing in on that as well. So now we're going to talk about sculpting visual shaping, the third of these. Um, let me actually bring this up. So as you can see, I know it's kind of a, it's not the best lighting in here, which is weird for a lighting demo, but you can see on me, there's a lot of like, shaping going on there's there's light to dark values going across my face coming along here even on this white wall behind me there's some darker values here and lighter values in the middle because there's a light kind of up over my head here and that is what we're talking about when we're talking about visual shaping we're talking about shifting from light value to dark value now let's get back into this okay so whenever we're working in film painting photography anything like that it's a 2d medium it's a flat screen, it's a flat painting, it's a flat print. And we need to convey 3D space into that 2D media. And we do that by light to dark fall off areas and, and also like color shifts and just feeling that volume and feeling that weight. So this A and B are the exact same uh, 3D scene. It's just that one has visual shaping to it, the B one, and the A one doesn't. And it just feels very graphic and very flat. Now, when we are like this actually comes up a lot when you're drawing, right? So you have the uh, very bright point and then actually let me skip ahead here. You've got the very bright point, which is where the center light is. You've got the highlight, which is actually the reflection of the light source uh, in CG. We'll call that the specular highlight. And then we've got the half tone. So now we're getting from the bright areas going down to the half tones. Then we get to this core shadow. So you would think the darkest part would be down here, but it's not. It's actually in the middle of the shape. And then down here towards the bottom is starting to get some reflected light before we get the occlusion and cast shadow. So the reflected light comes in when light comes in, hits a surface, bounces off that surface and back up underneath the object. So you can see light coming in here, hitting the surface and bouncing up this way. And when it bounces up, something cool happens. You actually get some color bleed from the base source up onto the original object. And you can see like, depending on the color of the surface, that changes whether it's red, uh, teal, yellow, or, or purple light kind of bouncing up underneath stuff. 
Same thing here. This is uh, some photographs of a, of a salt shaker that Jasmine took going around. So this is up underneath a uh, orange, uh, some warmer tones, and then some purples there. And again, same thing. Highlight area, light area into mid-tones, core shadows, dark shadows, and some reflected light bouncing up underneath. That is the basic element of shaping. And even is true of like flat walls. Like look at this. There's a white wall in a white room with just white lights. But if you kind of, we've zoned in here and just taken snippets out, you can see that there's uh, shaping within that flat surface. There's uh, some value shift from light to dark. And it really helps bring out dimensionality in something. It really helps, again, read that, that shape. The master of this. The all-time master is uh, Rembrandt, or his full name, which I found out for this presentation, of Rembrandt, Hermann Zoon van Rijn. So we'll just stick with Rembrandt. So Rembrandt uh, was this Dutch Renaissance painter who made these beautiful, soft uh, portrait, mostly portrait lighting, some still life stuff too, and just so much visual shaping. You can see just light coming across the characters. You can see it going from light to dark on the forehead, on their chin, on their nose, and just like every element's just like, so nicely shaped that, that you really get a sense of the volume. You really get a sense of that feeling. Now, we talk about Rembrandt lighting, and one of the core elements of it is something a little bit different and a little unique, and it's this. So on the opposite side of the face, you start to see a little triangle start to form there because that's light coming in past the character's head, going past the bridge of their nose, and then just creating that shape right here as a little triangle. And as you go through and you start to look at some of uh, Rembrandt's work, just think of the shaping, and then you like occasionally you'll start to see that little bit of a triangle. So again, everything's going from light to dark, and you start to see it in CG films as well. Like You can actually start to see the little bit of a triangle here, but like... I don't, CG characters kind of have different shaped faces than real humans, so sometimes you don't always get it. Like um, on this guy here, we've got the warm to cool, like the fall off the shaping around his nose, around each of his eyes, around his chin, um, around the dog here. And it's just so so much shaping, so much goodness going on. And you'll see this time and time again. In Coco, they use warm versus cool light um, to create shaping because it's not always about uh, shaping it through light and dark values. You can see on his face, we've got cool light coming in from the side here and warm light coming up from these leaves underneath. And so we're going from warm to cool. It's just about creating that um, that shaping. Absolutely loves these. Uh, this was something that one of our students, uh, Larry, uh, showed us in the, the TDU Facebook group page. And these are just some really cool portraits that they did from Coco. And this is Mama Coco. Look at her. It's just shaping coming across her face. It's picking up every wrinkle, every detail, every hair strand, every follicle, everything is just beautiful shaping from left to right. Absolutely love these. And then again, even into the Spider-Verse, like this is a graphic looking thing, but if you look across the character's face, um, you'll see lots of shaping, even on the background. Again, it's just flat color, but again, shaping from red to blue. It just creates uh, a dynamic image. It just creates good visual shaping. So those are the whys of lighting. It's emphasizing mood, directing the viewer's eye, and sculpting visual shaping. Now, I want to talk to you guys about one more thing before... Oh, wait, no. Before... I almost forgot. So I talked about those in isolation. But when you're lighting and when you're working, they're all going to be happening at the same time. So your job is to bring all of those elements together. Because if you can check off those three uh, off your list of what you're doing, you're going to be successful. So in the Incredibles tier here, we've got a lot of good shaping here on both of these characters. And you can see the light to dark fall off. See kind of the start of a triangle there. Uh, you see good shaping across his nose. But the mood is very different on these guys. He's got dark. Uh, his eyes are in shadow. Again, his uh, face is much more glowy. It's much more happily lit. Uh, the young guy, he uh, has got his whole future. He's very innocent. He doesn't really know what's going on versus the grizzled veteran who's seen too much and knows too much about what's happening. So we're using that to combine uh, all the things that we've learned. So again, good visual shaping. They're bright. They're popping off the very, very, very dark background. And the lighting is telling the mood of the two characters. Uh, this is a shot I lit for Epic. So this was tricky because again, uh, this whole film was all about lighting uh, characters that had camouflage with the environment, which makes it really hard to get them to read off. So we would put like this haze in the background a lot to get the saturation values to be different and get them to move forward. Um, so this is a character. He's being chased by the bad guys. He falls onto this log. Um, and I'll show you. I'll, I'll, let me step through. There's three things that kind of happen in the shot. So he falls, then an arrow strikes, and then uh, he jumps away. And this kind of bubbling happens around the base of this. So 
he lands. I need to create a patch of light here, not only highlighting his hands and his face, but directing the viewer's eye to what happens next, the arrow hitting. So we needed to create a pocket of light for that to happen. And actually, as he falls back this way, I hit him with another light on his face coming in from this side, just so you can read his expression. And then um, as he pops away, we just kind of zoom in and get a little bit of highlight in there so we can really read that arrow. Uh, it's another, you know, another uh, um, example of bringing it all together. We've got the warm tone characters over the, the the very green background. Something I really like about this one is just all the shaping that's happening in the leaves. I just love all that. Um, that's another shot I lit here from uh, Rio. So something to know about Rio is uh, the main character, Blue, on the screen right, and his love interest, uh, Jewel, on the screen left have very distinct blue colors. And in this sequence, this was a chase sequence. So we had to get their blue colors perfectly because again, shots are happening so, so, so fast. And then we needed to read her more cyan color versus his more blue color. So when we talk about lighting, uh, we wanna make sure to hit these hero colors so that um, we're always able to identify the character very quickly. Uh, and again, so in this shot, th there were some challenges here too where they are flat up against the wall. So just trying to get some shaping up in here, up around here, um, just trying to get their shape to read. And then also their beaks are very similar in color to the background here. So just hitting them with a little bit of rim light here on the edges just to get their beaks to separate out from the background was very tricky. A couple other shots from other films, Cicada Princess. Again, great film, check it out. Um, Great shaping here on this character. His bright values are making him pop forward. Look at all the shaping on each one of these individuals. And then the depth of field uh, to create some mystery off in the distance. Okay, now this is the one thing else I want to talk to you about other than the three keys of lighting because this is a very, very important part. And that's the power of reference. So whenever you're lighting something, uh, whenever you're working with us at TDU, one of the first things that we're always going to ask you is what's your reference? What is your goal, like what is your plan? Because the reference is like your blueprint for lighting. Now, does that mean that every time you light something you have to match it perfectly? No, but it's really great to have a visual blueprint moving forward with your shot to have an understanding of what you want. So let's say we're lighting a shot like this and it's a dark hallway and there's just a bunch of light cracking through uh, the bathroom. We wanna know things, we wanna know how bright it is uh, behind the door, we want to see the shape of the light coming through here. We want to see how the reflections hit off the wood floor and the painted wall. You know, we want to we want to really take a good an analysis of all this stuff. We want to see how the light is hitting just these little ridges here, and just how like much light is spilling over this edge. And by looking at that and analyzing that and understanding what we're seeing, we can translate that to our images and really, really make things that. You know, again, we don't always have to be photo real about it, but it, they they translate into the image. So we've got, you know, like say we want to have a shot or trying to analyze how much TV light is affecting a dark room. So we've got this bright screen, how bright the screen gets. But you can see up here, there's light spilling on the ceiling. Like how great is this distance? How far does the light reach across the room? You can see some light spilling out from behind the TV on the wall here. Just a lot of like little intricacies that we can start to pick up. You can use... Because uh, lots of times we'll be talking about things happening either in the summer or in the winter and the fall. And you can see here, this is the exact same spot in Central Park um, in the autumn, winter, spring, and summer. And you can see that that they each come with their own color palette. And now it's not necessarily true that an audience member will look at something and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely summer. But if we're talking about um, summer and where we're, we're kids are on summer break and they're playing and, and our main character and she's uh, playing in Central Park, we want her to feel like she's in summertime. We want to send some subtle cues that it's summertime by getting the color of the grass right, the color of the trees right, the color of the atmosphere right. And we can do that by just finding some reference images to make sure that we're not you know, fooling ourselves by thinking something looks a certain way when in reality it looks very different. The bottom is just time of day. So again, things are happening in the morning, afternoon, evening, at night. This is from uh, the roof of my apartment building, exact same angle of, of New York. Um, but just four different times a day. So you can see that the color of the sky, the color of the shadows, the color of the light, all of it changes over the course of the day. And we can use that to help tell the story. Uh, with reference, we can evaluate key to fill ratio. That's how bright the key light is versus how bright the shadow area is. So if you've got sunlight coming in, you can hit an, hit an object, hit a character, and then it casts a shadow. So how dark that shadow versus how bright the key is. Now, there are no right or wrong answers to this. 
There's no like perfect key to fill ratio. It's all about like what mood you want to set and what feeling you want to create in your shot. So what you want to do is you want to find something that was similar to the mood that uh, find find a shot that was that's a similar look that you want to create and then identify the individual components like the key to fill ratio and then mimic those in your own shot. Uh, this is a great example of Jasmine and I. You'll see our little light bulb family kept bouncing around the TDU courses. Uh, we 3D printed out the, the one of the characters and we just took them into different environments and we placed them around uh, and we just photographed them to see how he looked with bounce light, see how he looked in, in, in different environments. Love this one. So this is from Incredibles 2. Uh, just look at the headlight of this motorcycle. It's like it's just like the perfect amount of uh, that. So if you look at the headlight of a car, it's very smooth on the outside, but it has like a fractal look on the inside. And they just did like a really brilliant job. And it's just like when when you start to read that reference and you start to look at images and you see that translated in the CG, it's just so cool to see. Uh, this is one I just did for a trailer that we just released for Spies in Disguise, which is coming out in the autumn of this year, I think. Uh, we've got, I, I did a lot of reference in the US Capitol building to see how that would look versus like how much you actually see of a distant city off in the background to get that. And then just creating the color shaping in there is, is, uh, was a real, um, a real struggle. So my favorite story of reference is this, because this is something, again, that comes up, you know, people will come to us and say like, listen, I'm using an alien or, uh, an environment that doesn't exist. You know, I'm, I'm lighting on, you know, avatar and we're in this planet of blue people. Um, how, how am I going to use reference? The example I always give is Shrek. So Shrek is an ogre. And unfortunately, ogres don't exist in the real world. And so Shrek, uh, you know, it'd be very easy to say, like, well, he's not an ogre, so we're just not going to look at reference or anything. But we needed, but Shrek has certain elements, right? He needs to be a big guy that's lovable, that audiences love, that they feel a connection to, that they can interact with. So they at DreamWorks, um, and I've got unofficial reports of this, but they uh, they allowed us to write it in our, our book. but. Um, when they were creating Shrek, they looked at this guy's references. Maurice Tillet, he was a wrestler in the 30s and 40s, a French guy, and he was beloved by fans. Everyone loved him. The guy spoke like 17 languages. He was a poet. He just happened to suffer from this um, disorder that created his bones to grow and his hands to get super large and his head to get super large and all of his features to get uh, over large. And but people still loved him. And he was a big intimidating guy. So he made that same balance that Shrek wanted to and you can't tell me that they're not the same dude like these guys look so much alike it's ridiculous okay so enough talking about lighting now i'm going to take you all through uh, a lighting setup oh, flip this around here and we are going to get on the screen here all right so we've got this guy this is our mr bean character and I'm going to show you guys how I lit him kind of from start to finish. Speed this along. So this is the, uh, the final product. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit of how we got there. So he's free and totally available for you all to use on the RenderMan website. Uh, you just go to renderman.pixar.com slash Mr. Bean. Uh, you can download him there. You can find the original artist, this Bruno Ponti. Uh, he's a uh, artist based in Barcelona. And all you got to do is just click that download project link at the top. And for this project, I also went to HDRI Haven, and I was able to grab some uh, uh, HDRI maps there. Totally free to use. I use this uh, graffiti wall one. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, you can download them in, 16, in uh, 16K. And what I did was I just went ahead and opened it up here. And this is what you're going to see when you open uh, that, that Maya file initially. You've got um, the character. He's got this background. There's display layers. You can turn them on and off. Um, and again, the reason why I'm recommending you all use this one is it's very, very easy. It's very straightforward. The, uh, you know, render man's free, this character's free, um, all that good stuff. But for us to get started, we want to go ahead and delete all these lights. Just get rid of them because we want to create our own lighting rig. So we're starting off with black and that's exactly what we want. Now, the very first thing that I want to do is I want to create, uh, an environment light and I want to apply the HDRI image to uh, the dome light. And so you can see it comes in as bright white and illuminates them all over the place. What we want to do is go ahead and uh, apply this graffiti shelter TX file. And you can see now it's applied to the dome around it. And as we rotate this dome around the character, 
the bright spots of the Sky Dome are lighting the character as if he was actually in that space. So the renderer is reading that image and illuminating from there. Now we can adjust this and we can take down the, um, the exposure level and uh, kind of dial in the look of that a little bit more. So I just want this to be kind of like the skylight, the secondary light for me. So I went ahead and just turned down the exposure and turn off the primary vis visibility so it doesn't show up there in the background. From there, I want to feel uh, do a little bit more uh, feeling of the uh, that light coming in from the screen right side. So I went ahead and created a uh, rectangular light, which we will make nice and big. And you can see that this light functions similarly to how a light would in reality. So the larger it is, the softer the shadows and the brighter it gets as well. Uh, you can look through the light like you can in other renderers, and you can take a look at it off to the side, and you can see now the light's kind of coming in from the character's screen right side. And we're just going to kind of adjust the shape there just to, to make it mimic uh, the shape of the, the original and adjust the exposure. We can adjust the specular value so it doesn't get too specky on the screen right side. Um, and all that good stuff. So it's just uh, a nice soft light coming in from the right. Um, and, and then from there, so the one thing that, again, thinking back to my love of 12 angry men, I want to kind of zero in the eye or the light on his eye. So what I'm doing is I'm going to create a, uh, a rod filter. A rod filter is a Pixar render man term. Uh, it's for range of darkness. And so you can see it creates this object and wherever this object is, it will cast a shadow from the light that you have it attached to. And now as I move it around, I can start to kind of really zero it in. So that's different than lighting on a, on a, on a live action set. I can't create this fake object. I would have to use, like I said, barn doors or find a guy wearing a hat and use that. But for this, we can create these range of darkness values in RenderMan to really help zero in focus on the character's eye. Um, from there, I want to start creating some bounce light because I remember we talked about bounce light in our example and light coming up from underneath. So we don't want the area on the opposite side of his key to be the darkest. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a, a plane and apply a shader to it to create light bouncing back up from the other side. And you can see as we rotate it, he starts to, uh, the light comes in from our rectangular light and bounce back up on his uh, on his body because Render Man is a path tracer. So it doesn't necessarily need only primary light sources. It reads that bounce light and renders it um, accurately. And uh, you can turn off the primary visibility of that plane so it only uh, shows the bounce light so you don't actually get it appearing in your render, which is something we definitely, definitely don't want. And so now we've got some good bounce light coming in from this left side, but the problem is, is now he, like we're really losing some of the specularity on his right side. We're not feeling any of the shimmer of his skin. So now, I, so now I'm creating a second uh, rectangular light which will only bounce fill, uh, I'm sorry, specular light on the screen left side of his face. So you can kind of just get that a uh, little bit of uh, like just almost like sweat, like just a little bit of moisture on the skin there. So we'll go ahead and uh, make that light a little bit warmer because again, this is a warm scene. We've got warm light coming in, wood walls all around, just lots of warmth just bouncing around all over the place. So dial in the, the value. We'll go ahead and take down the diffuse amount. So it's only emitting specular values in there and just creates a little bit of subtle shaping in the uh, in the fill area on the character's face. Now we want to separate out the character from the background. Like I talked about in the Rio shot where I did that little bit of rim light on the beak. I really want to get his hair to stand out from the background. So what I'm doing is I'm going to create a couple of rim lights, one on the screen left side and one on the screen right side. So this is setting up the screen left side one. So again, looking through the light so we can kind of position it. And what I usually like to do is just crank up the exposure sometimes just to really get that position in place. Because at the, at the end of all this, I always end up having to dial in values and colors anyway. So might as well crank it up so we can really see how it's influencing things. So I get in a place that I want, start to dial in the exposure back in, and then I'll go ahead and, uh, and again, you know, make the color a little bit warmer because uh, we want it to reflect the environment that we're in. And now, uh, and also because he is a warm tone character, all this warm light will just help his hero color read. It'll just help him really kind of uh, bounce forward. So 
uh, made a duplicate of that light. And now we're doing the same thing on the other side because we just want him to really kind of pop out from the background. Because we're not, we're going to use that HDRI map as our backplate in the comp, but we're not matching to it perfectly. We're more focused on making him beautiful in a shot like this. Now I'm seeing his up under his uh, hair right there was getting a little bit dark. So I added another plane to reflect light onto his head there. And quickly I noticed that the it, that it had to be a lot smaller than I was anticipating. So even something like this is hitting his head in a really flat kind of way. So I had to make it nice and small. And I, you know, like I just kept having to make it smaller and smaller and smaller to really get it uh, exactly how I wanted it. And that's pretty much again, and then turning off the, the primary visibility of the stuff. Cause we don't want it to be, you know, like showing up, you can see it just popped up there in a second. We don't want it showing up in the render itself. So now uh, we've got pretty much where we want it. Now I just want to talk about the render man render settings quickly. Um, again, very similar to the uh, Maya render settings that you'll see. Um, again, we just needed to uh, increase our overall quality. Um, and then because whenever we're test rendering, we are just doing it in a low resi. Here I'm showing how I created AOV passes. Uh, AOVs are embedded um, layers into the render so we can break out the diffuse versus the specular layer versus like normals and Z-depth stuff all into one render. And the other thing that I want to do is create crypto mats. If you guys don't know what crypto mats are, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, I've got a whole breakdown of crypto mats there. Uh, this is something that'll save your life. So this is a render that happens at render time, no cost to you, and it will break out ID mats for everything that you're rendering so that in the comp, you can isolate just his eyes or just his hair or just his jacket and make changes to that accordingly. So uh, uh, RenderMan ha does have a way of, of, of setting that up as well. Okay, so we got the character, we've got him right out. Now I just wanna do one auxiliary pass to kind of really help get into the next level. So one of the things that we talk a lot about in our character lighting class is how to handle eye lighting. Um, and lots of times it's, it's a matter of creating some render passes. And in this render pass, I'm creating, uh, I'm making the eyes a perfect reflection of the environment. So I turn them into like a metallic object and we want to take the rest of the character and we want to turn off his primary visibility and just make it so that he is only reflecting in the eyes. So turning off his skin, now he's just hair and a suit and just weird reflective eyes. We don't like that. So uh, turned off his his jacket. We turned off his hair, um, and we just want really want to focus in on the eyes. And so now that we have that, we want to create like a nice eye ding on him. And the eye dings happen uh, usually on the uh, between the pupil and the iris. And so it's just like a little circle. We talk a lot about that in the character lighting class. Um, again, just making a shape to mimic that circle and. I just want to turn off the cast of the light and only have it in, in reflections and then just applying a bright constant uh, color to it there so that we can, you can see the, in, in the uh, light here now, it's just kind of reflecting this small dot and we just kind of want to position that right where we want it. And again, in this background, it, it, like, you know, lots of times it's a circle, but we could have used like a rectangle to mimic the door. You've got some options there. It's really about the type of uh, ding that you want to create. Okay, so now we've got uh, the ding set up. We're gonna go ahead and now uh, shift over into Nuke. So this is our final image, and I wanna show you a quick breakdown of how we got there. So we'll start with that background. So again, I took that same exact HDRI image. I knew I wanted that bright door off to the screen, right-hand side, so I transformed it over there. Uh, of course, that leaves a big gap. So I uh, transformed another one, pieced those together, blurred them out, because again, we're not making him, we're just using it as like a lighting reference. So we just want it to roughly be in there. Um, now we take this render. And one of the things that I noticed when, after I rendered it out was like, he's got some gnarly specular highlights on his uh, jacket here. So what I did was I used the AOVs that I created to isolate just the diffuse from the specular pass. And I combined our direct and indirect diffuse light together. And then I went ahead and uh, reformatted those and built it back together. So again, it's eliminating that problematic speckly speck light in his jacket. And then I layered it back over the top. So again, you can see the before and after there. And then I just threw in a little grade note just to make the lighting uh, a little bit more appealing on his jacket there. Um, so now we're just gonna go down through the comp. We did some eye lighting stuff. 
And again, this is the uh, crypto mat. And you can see that I can use that to isolate an eye. I can use the roto to isolate just the screen left eye to add a little bit of brightness there. Um, we can add the reflections in uh, using a couple different tricks that way. And now you can see, let's go ahead and uh, zoom in. And you can see uh, some different reflections on the eye there to really show that he's reflecting the environment. Um, now we want to add uh, some other comp tricks. So there's light wrap around the edge there to get him to wrap against the background. So it's not just like a hard pixel to pixel um, uh, difference. So it's like uh, the bright patches of the background are wrapping around uh, him a little bit. It's like a little bit of a lens ab uh, abnormality. Uh, and then at the end, we just do some final color correction stuff, adding a little bit of glow to it, adding a little bit of vignette. And in the end, we have this final image. So when I first looked at the Mr. Bean on the website, I was very, you know, I thought that looked great. Um, and now having gone through this process, I think we've also made something great. I think it kind of is matching his hero color a little bit better. It's a little more dynamic lighting, a little more shaping. Um, and so it's really something to be that we're proud of there. Okay, so now hop back over here. Um, okay. Now I wanna to talk to you guys about a TDU student. So we've talked about the whys of lighting. We've talked about uh, walking you through um, a full lighting rig. Now I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit more about TDU specifically and what we can do for you and the whole reason why you're here. So the first student I want you to meet is Anwar. So Anwar came to us about five years ago. Um, he was, uh, he never went to college. He loved art. Um, couldn't afford college. He lived in Mexico at the time and he just started uh, getting involved in CG and he was working in a small studio down there. And Anwar was incredibly talented. He was incredibly passionate. He just uh, lacked, we just needed to focus that attention and get him going at some lighting, but his talent was definitely there. So for years we worked with Anwar. He, uh, he would light multiple shots. We'd go through the critique process. We would give him feedback back and forth and we watched him bloom from a lighter at this small company in Mexico to being a CG soup of that company to working on one of um, uh, Mexico's first animated uh, features. And then he got a job at NPC up in Vancouver. Uh, we worked on like Batman versus Spider-Man or uh, it was Batman versus Superman. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and then he got a job at Sony and uh, and as you guys know, this is something that he lit and created the alley. So if you've ever lit the alley from TDU, that was uh, Anwar's creation. And we are so proud today that Anwar just finished work on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And if you want to know more about him, we do have a full interview with him. But Anwar used what we had to offer here at TDU and the critiques of Jasmine and I to enhance his career and start something that ultimately led him to work on an Academy Award winning film. And we are so proud of him. We love working with him. And it's just the kind of classic TDU story. So when we say that he used TDU, like what are we talking about? What exactly did he do it? How did he do it? So let me just take you all through the, the classes that we offer here at TDU and how he was able to jumpstart his career. So at first, we will start you off with the uh, TDU Power of Light course. So this is uh, a more focused version of what kind of what I was doing there. I definitely go a lot slower. We talk about how to um, build some lights. We talk about creating shadow softness. We talk about um, just all the different, uh, we talk about the three whys and how to implement those into your own shots. Something else that I found in this, which is one of my favorite things is this study that, oh, let me hop over. I realized I wasn't sharing my screen there. Let me get back. Okay, now you guys can see my screen. Um, so we will talk about um, this incredible presentation, which is these researchers were putting links on uh, an audience's eye as they watched There Will Be Blood and like monitored their eye around the screen. And so this really helps us understand what the audience is looking at and getting a better understanding of directing the viewer's eye. So we'll break down lighting uh, more deeply there. Next up, we'll talk about uh, compositing for the lighting artist, because again, as you saw in our example, lighting isn't only about creating lights in, in 3D, it's about building a final image. It's about constructing a final workflow. Because it's not 
you know, at, at most animation houses, the lighter's responsibility does not start and stop with lighting. It continues into the compositing stage. So we'll show you lighting techniques or compositing techniques. We'll show you how to get fin final product, a final polish on your shot. We'll show you how to break out shots and how to build them back together into ultimately beautiful uh, final images. And in the same way that lighting doesn't start and stop with uh, compositing, it also doesn't uh, start and stop without material. So lighting isn't anything without material value. So Jasmine takes you through uh, creating the materials for an entire character. And we talk about creating the garments, the skin. Uh, we'll also take you through how to create things like her eye. Because again, her eye is so important uh, to good character lighting that creating good eye materials is absolutely essential in that process. So if we're talking about eye lighting in materials, then we're going to talk about it more in our character lighting course. So this course we'll talk again, because we always talk about the three whys of lighting, but this is a more detailed focused approach to that. This is how do we create shaping on the eye? How do we direct the viewer's eye to the character? How do we um, make sure that the hero's color is in place? But we will take you through theoreticals of it. And we will also take you through some character walkthroughs similar. And I, actually the one that I just did for you all here, it's going to be in the character lighting course as well only much, much slower, and I will uh, go through the, the detailed setup of how we were able to, to do things a little further. Then we've got environment lighting. Uh, environment lighting is a whole other beast. So we've got how do we create vast landscapes using uh, CG? Like we want to create uh, atmospheric fall off an aerial perspective. We want to create gobo lights to create patches of uh, light and shadow. We want to talk about depth of field. We want to talk about how we make a face a space feel complex and dynamic and interesting and exciting and by while still focusing the viewer's eye. So I did this, uh, I did the same uh, TDU alley that Anwar created. I lit it up here and show you all a uh, walk through on that. And we'll show you guys a bunch of different environments there. And then we have the big course. This is our lighting and animated film course. This is where we pull it all together. Character lighting, environment lighting, materials, compositing. And we not only show you all how we created the seven shot animated short, we actually give you all the assets so you can make it yourself. We give you all the characters. We give you every animation file. So you don't have to do a thing except for get in there and start lighting an animated short. So, uh, again, we'll take you through, uh, you know, this is showing you how to create a gobo light. We will take you through the compositing stage, show you how we build the biometric light, how we're using crypto mats to dial in the colors and the look of everything, and ultimately do some final cleanup of like render noise and final rendering and all that stuff. So we don't hide anything. I show you all my ugly lighting along the iteration to getting the final uh, beautiful work. And then our last class is getting and succeeding at your job. So this is the stuff that nobody talks about in this industry. This is salary negotiation. This is how to, how to build a demo reel that companies will love. This is talking about how to succeed once you're in the industry. Like, what are the ways to behave in order to become successful? This is all like the insider information that Jasmine will take you through on that one. And she'll also show you uh, the demo reels of, of artists that we've known, that we've worked with, that have uh, been successful in this industry. And finally, we also are, well, this is our TDU Arnold for Meyer workshop. So this is a more of a technical workshop that we add to the uh, to the to the TDU lighting bundle. And this is just going to show you the kind of the ins and outs of the technical stuff. We have another um, former student working on a Redshift class, and we've just got all so much to build up. So this was what Anwar used to create his uh, demo reel to ultimately get him his first job. And then we worked with him throughout the process for him to get his uh, final, let's see to get him going on his career. So that's how he did it. So not only at TDU did he use all of our courses, all of our critiques, all of our knowledge, but he also used our assets. So again, we talked about Anwar's Alley, totally available to all of you all here. We also have um, you know, lots of students have already lit it many different ways. We've held hung Christmas lights from there. We've had it in daytime, we've had it in nighttime, we've used it in multiple settings. We partner with other companies because, like we said, we know how important it is to get you all assets to light. We've partnered with TurboSquid, and we've got a bunch of different assets that we're uploading now uh, to the TDU library. So you can download these and light these for, for, as part of your TDU bundle. We also work with Anim School. Anim School is a uh, leading school for animated students. 
we are partnering with them where they will provide their animated projects for us and our students to light. And it's created some really dynamic, um, interesting uh, final projects where we're just making such cool stuff. We work with Petit 23, who, who creates characters like Piao here to give our students amazing characters to light. And now we are also proud to announce that we are building up our bunny character. This is something that Jasmine and I have worked on for a long time. So. Uh, as you've seen, we have the TDU bunny as our main mascot. So now we're making a fully fledged, uh, designed, modeled, rigged. He's going to be animated. She's going to be adorable. And she's going to be available to each and every one of you to like. We're just finishing up the material process now. Then we're going to pass it off to an animation company who's going to create some amazing animated shorts for us. And we're going to use those uh, to give those to all of you so you can light it. Because, again, we are so driven with this idea of providing you all with the best assets possible so you can light up your reel and get you the job of your dreams. So before we get to the, the super special bonus offer, I want you to meet one more lighting student. This is Shane Sternstein. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar with uh, the, the TDU Wednesday Live, Shane uh, was one of our interviews as well. So Shane came to us about a year ago. He was struggling. Um, to find his way in his career. And like I said, I've been there, Jasmine's been there. Uh, he knew he wanted to be a lighting artist and he didn't know how to get there. He had the talent, he had drive, he just didn't know how to make a reel that the studios would take seriously. So he's gone through our classes with us. He's created some really beautiful stuff. He's listened to our critiques. He's uh, gone through uh, critique after critique after critique and slowly improved his work and we are very, very proud to say that at this point, Shane uh, got into the training program at DreamWorks and is now a full-fledged lighter at DreamWorks Animation and working on his first project. So when we say that we are excited about this process, we don't necessarily mean it that, um, that we think that this can help you get a job. We know this can help you get a job because it's done it before because there are so many more students. We have students, uh, not just these guys, but we have so many more that are telling us about how we have helped them along the way. And it's honest to God, these are from the last couple months. This is uh, Carla and Katerina have both uh, landed really amazing job opportunities. And I have to tell you that it's not only uh, cool for them, it's this thing that makes Jasmine and I get out of bed in the morning that makes us so proud to do this to makes us work every day with you guys. Cause we started TDU because we were probably where a lot of you are, where we were lost and we didn't know where we wanted to go and, or we wanted to be lighting artists and we just didn't know how to get there. And we had to struggle for a long time and take out way too much money in student loans in order to get there. And so we are so proud that we can help you all get to the final uh, place where you are now, which is finding good resources, finding assets to light, finding direction, getting critiques, getting feedback on your work, and building towards your ultimate goal. So now we're on to our special deal. Are you ready for it? You guys have, and I should just give you a bonus because you've listened to me drone on for like an hour, uh, like just over an hour now. So that's why you all are getting a special deal because you've listened to me for this long. Okay, here it is. So we've got the ultimate lighting bundle, right? It's all seven of our lighting courses, plus all the technical workshops, plus asset access to all of our assets, plus access to our private Facebook group where you all can post your images. We will provide feedback for each and every one of you. We will do video critiques. We will do written critiques. We do everything we can to respond within 24 hours. And I, I don't think I've missed a 24 hour window yet. And we that's where we work with you we that's where we also share cool ideas where we find images and inspiration out there and we share it with each other like i said our student larry showed us that uh the the coco stuff this is our our chance to really get together and interact with you by default if you bought each one of our courses individually there would be uh 3593 dollars but nope not for you for you guys it's 1999 plus now this is the one more exclusive offer Are you ready for it here we go if you sign up today, within the next 24 hours, Jasmine and I will sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and go through whatever you want to talk about in terms of your work, in terms of your demo reel, in terms of whatever you're struggling with right now to help you get to the career of your dreams. Because that's that's the only thing that we care about here. 
That is our main focus and drive in doing all of this. We want to take you from where you are and help you get the career that you ultimately, that you know that you can do, that you know that you can be. Because think about it for yourself, right? Like you can picture yourself working at this really cool studio, working on the next big animated film. You could be the next Anwar. You could be the next person who's struggling and not knowing how to get from point A to B. And in just a few short years, he is one of the key lighters on an uh, Academy Award winning film. And we can't tell you how much that means to us and how proud we are of that. So if you are interested in the offer, we, let's see, can we get it up here? Here we go. All you've got to do is click this link over here somewhere on the right-hand side of the screen. And you want to click the Let's Get Lighting. It'll take you the offer. We started this countdown clock. You've got 24 hours to get signed up. And okay, so we are, that's where we are. So if you all have any questions, I know uh, Jasmine's been on here the whole time. So let's see how we're doing with the chat over here. And I, if you all have any questions at all that Jasmine, oh man, she's been typing feverishly. I can see. Uh, so yeah. So let's see if there's any questions that I have for you guys. <laughs> yes, she has. Okay. Her fingers hurt from typing. <laughs> okay. Which course lets you light anim school work? Um, any one of our courses will allow you to light anim school work. So it's not an, it's not an official thing. We just opened up our community for the end of school students to post their work. Um, and we will, we've, we've got a backlog of stuff. So if you signed up today, you could hop into our Facebook group and we get you paired up with an end of school student and get you, uh, and get you going there. So any other, other questions? Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. We will go through all of these questions here on the side. Is there a payment plan available? Yes, Elizabeth, there is a payment plan available. Uh, we've got four payments packages um, uh, if you sign up uh, through the website. In fact, let me uh, go ahead and send you to that. Let me get that real quick. And we will um, have you all set up there. So again, so I'm adding this to the chat window. You scroll down to the bottom, you will get uh, you you will get that same deal. So if you, you scroll down to the bottom, you get the four payment plan. It spaces out over four months. Um, is a two thousand dollar price in temporary? Nope, that is all the time. We will we don't mess with our prices because that's just that's the lowest that we can possibly offer this and uh, still get you guys where you need. We'll never raise. We'll we'll never you know bump it around. We won't move it around on you. All we're gonna do is uh, we're just here to offer you. Um, the special offer of the Jasmine and I's one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So price won't change. We're just going to, that's, that's the, that's the big bonus. That's the big add on. So let's see if there are any other questions here. <laughs> so I've got, just so you guys, Jasmine, come over here. Come here. So just so you guys know, uh, Jasmine and I've been in the same room the whole time. So she is, uh, so she can pop in and say hi real quick. So, cause we are informal here. So hi, Jasmine. I did not prepare to go on camera, <laughs> so sorry, I'm not fancy. So it's good, but she was just there in case I forgot to turn my mic on or I forgot to share my screen or anything like that. So from both of us guys, we can't tell you how excited we are to have you as part of the TDU family. Um, we just, it's, you're fine, you're looking on camera, it's fine. Guys, we're so excited to have you. We can't wait to get started working with you. We are convinced and we have seen it time and time again that our courses have what it takes to get you guys on the on the path to the lighting uh, careers of your dreams. So let's get started. Sign up now. Let us know if you have any questions, and we'll talk to you guys soon, right? Yeah. All right. I'm excited. Until then, guys. Bye. Bye.